Rock service. It is good to see you all here today. Those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you. I told our different ministry leaders that uh, if they give me a shirt, that I will wear it on mornings when I preach. It's really just a ploy to get a free t-shirt. But today I am supporting one of our ministries here at Sherwood Oaks. I'm not gonna tell you which one it is. I'm gonna send you on a little scavenger hunt through our facility because somewhere in this building is a big sign that has this ministry and this logo on it. And so if you're curious, then maybe after service, you can kind of walk around, see if you can find it. But, But I love this ministry. I love what it is doing in our community. And and I just, I'm so excited about what God is doing in and through Sherwood Oaks. I just wanna kind of give a little bit of a recap from last Sunday, uh, throughout that challenge to you that as uh, folks from Afghanistan are coming into like literally our backyard, our neighborhood, uh, seeking refuge and resettlement, that as a church, And in response to our faith in Jesus, we want to respond to that need. And so we asked, would you be willing to donate new clothes, new shoes, hygiene items, even soccer balls that we could pass on and send to the kids whose lives have just been completely turned upside down? And you all responded. Uh, It was so cool to hear how life groups have gotten together and said, like, man, what can we do to to pull our resources together and buy some clothes and donate it to the church? And and those things are going to be going out even this week to folks who, who are in need. And that's going to be continuing. There's 6,600 people that they're expecting to come through Camp Atterbury and and, and waves of about 250 to 300. And so we just want to be right there to do anything we can uh, to assist and to show uh, the love of of Jesus. Uh, We also shared the story of a family who came to know Jesus right here within the walls of, of our church. And we're in Afghanistan. He studied um, at IU, went back to his home country and served as a doctor, counselor, worked for the UN, who, and then was a translator for the US, which as we talked about last week, put him on a, a literal hit list for the Taliban. And so they fled, Taliban came looking for him. They're in hiding. And by God's grace, we were able to make contact with them this past week. Um, a couple of folks in our church have actually talked to them and passed on like, hey, we're praying for you. Passed on that we're collecting items for fellow Afghans who are, who are coming into Camp Atterbury. And they're still in hiding, but they wanted us to pass on this message to you. They said, thank you for your prayers and your efforts. And then when I read this next part, uh, tears came to my eyes. He said, I am proud to be a part of Sherwood Oaks. That's pretty cool. Let's pray for him. Yeah, praise God. Man. So God, we thank you for your church that is so much larger than what we see and experience here on Sunday mornings. How the the reach uh, from this place is stretching all across the world. And God, it is just an honor to be able to um, have family members from this place, this body of believers that are in places where they are serving, they are living as witnesses. And we just continue to pray for this couple, Lord. We pray for their protection. We pray for their provision. Father, I pray that as their church family, we will respond in kind and continue to lift them up before you and that we will, will, will look at our own lives and see and just evaluate what it means and what it will take for us to follow Jesus as faithfully as, as they are. And so God, I just pray for them. I pray for all of the efforts. May your love be known more because of uh, this situation that is going. Thank you, Lord, that you can bring peace and redemption to difficult situations in a way that only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, a few years ago, we took the, the girls to see uh, a, a movie called Wonder Park in the movie theater. If you haven't seen it, Wonder Park is about uh, this girl who has just a really vivid imagination, and her and her mom uh, create this imaginary amusement park called Wonderland, and it's filled with all kinds of uh, fun rides and attractions and, and animals. And early on in the movie, the mom gets sick and has to go away um, for, for treatment. And this young girl doesn't quite know what to do with herself. She has all of these emotions that come flooding up in her, uh, feelings of anger and loss and, and pain. And, and she doesn't know how to cope with what is happening to her mom and, and in her life. And in her frustration, 
And she takes these, these plans for, for Wonderland that her and her mom have created and she just tears them all up. She wads them up. She, she destroys them just in, her, in her, her fear and in her hurt. And it's really a movie that's about how do we deal with these big emotions of pain and loss um, disguised as an animated kids movie. Well, when we went to watch it, um, my mom had just recently passed away. And so this movie brought up all kinds of emotions that honestly, I was not prepared for. Like I went into the movie thinking that it's just gonna be a fun movie about you know an amusement park. And then we start watching and I realize, oh no, it's so much more to, than that. And this is not going to end well for me. And about halfway through the movie, not even kidding, the girls looked at me and they're like, daddy, are you okay? Like, you're crying a lot. I'm like, your mom's crying. And they turned over and they looked at their mom, which gave me some time to wipe away the tears from my eyes. <laughs> you know, I think that the, the best art kind of does that for us. It, it brings up something in us. It makes us kind of reflect on our own life makes us um, see the world that we live in a, in a different way or see it maybe for what it really is. The best art, whether it's a painting, a movie, a book, maybe even a song, it doesn't just paint a picture. It doesn't just tell a story for us to enjoy. The best art helps us understand and see our world more clearly. The best art helps us understand and see ourselves more clearly. I think of the scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off when Cameron is looking at the painting in the art museum, having this existential, soul-wrenching, life-changing experience as he just gazes into this piece of art. He sees himself, he sees his world in it. It just keeps zooming in closer and closer and closer. And from that moment on, he changes. He's a different person for the rest of the movie. Some of you have books that are like that. You have Movies that are like that, songs that maybe have been that for you. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what our text is today. Genesis 3 paints a picture of something that happened a long time ago, something that absolutely changed the course of history. It changed everything for everyone. But the power of this passage that we're gonna be looking at today is not just in its ability to paint a picture of something that happened, but its ability to help us see and understand the world in which we live. It's ability to even reflect a little bit about who we are and why we do the things that we do. And so if you have a Bible or a Bible app that you like to use, I invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, we're we're in the third week, as Quentin said, in our series uh, called Beginnings where we are looking at the creation account with fresh eyes. And and up to this point in the account, everything has been great. It's been good. It's been very good. In fact, it's been perfect. And I think that this perfection of Genesis 1 and 2 is perfectly captured in this verse at the end of Genesis 2, right before we get to our, our passage for today, it says this in verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They were naked and were not ashamed. That means that there was no hiding between them. There was no pretense. There was no wondering if they were loved or valued cherished. Adam and Eve felt no insecurity or guilt or shame between them. They they fully knew one another and they were fully known by one another. Not only that, but they fully knew and were fully known by, by God. There was this deep relationship between them. There was no pain, no betrayal, no crying as they went to bed because of the pain of the day. No anxiety when they woke up thinking about what's ahead. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve felt whole and at peace. They experienced this depth of freedom and joy that every single one of us desire, whether we know it or not. In the Garden, everything was exactly as God intended for it to be. But the picture is about ready to change. Let's look at our verse today, Genesis 3, verse 6. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food 
and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. It's our core verse for the week. And if you've been going along with us and memorizing these passages, the first two verses have been really easy, right? I mean, it's just like one, one sentence, uh, 10 words max, I think. And, and then we get to this one. It's a little bit trickier. There's a lot more words in there. And uh, so as you are going through and trying to commit this verse to memory, I just encourage you, go onto the Core 52 website. Uh, Mark Moore has some videos up there for each week that give us some memorization techniques as we try to hide God's word in, in our heart. You can also uh, download these lock screens that our media team is mating, making for, for your device. Uh, we're putting them out on our social and every week it has that week's memory verse. And so you can download it. You can put it on your lock screen for your device. You can find all of that at socc.org slash core 52. But today I'm introducing a new way for us to memorize a new tool that we can put in our tool belt. And I am hoping that this becomes um, semi-regular as we go through the next year. I'm I'm calling it uh, the Core 52 Sing Along with Tim Thompson. Let's check out this when video. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and, and ate, ate it. it. She also <laughs> gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Genesis 3 6. Genesis 3 6. Genesis. Three, six. Yeah, isn't that great? That's fun. Now, <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to put that on our social channels uh, this week so that it can get stuck in your head like it's been stuck in my head all week. In fact, I woke up this morning brushing my teeth going, Genesis 3, 6. So yeah, that's something for you to look forward to this week. Now, uh, for many of you, this, this verse is very familiar You've read it before. You've heard countless sermons about it. You've studied it in the past. Some of you might be brand new. You know something about the story it involves maybe something about an apple, but you're not really sure what's so bad about apples. <laughs> but today I want us to kind of look at Genesis 3 with some fresh eyes. And I want us to, I want us to look at this passage in, in three different ways. Today we're gonna look at Genesis 3 and see the picture that it paints of something that happened long ago. We're gonna see how Genesis 3 also serves as a window through which we can see and understand our world and just why it is the way that it is. But Genesis 3 isn't just a picture and it's not just a window. Genesis 3 also serves as a mirror, a mirror in which we can really see ourselves and why we are sometimes the way that we are. And I want, to, I want to start by looking at Genesis 3, at, at the picture that it paints. And to do that, we need to zoom out just a little bit and get a little bit more context. And so let's, let's back up to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of, eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you? that you were naked. Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And 
the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. (laughs) And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent, the serpent deceived me (laughs) and I ate. So what's going on here? Well, the serpent, Satan, comes to Eve in the garden, begins to sow the seeds of doubt and the goodness of God that he is trustworthy, and that he has given them everything that they need. And he does this by telling them a half-truth. He, he says, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Well, that's not what God said. It's not that at all. In fact, God had given them every tree and every fruit and every good thing in the garden. He had just drawn a boundary around this one. And Eve picks up on that half truth. And she says, oh, no, no, no. We can eat from any tree in the garden. We just can't eat from that tree. But listen, the, the, the seed had already been planted, not just in her mind, but in her heart. And she was already starting to wonder if maybe God is holding out. And she tells a half-truth of her own. She says, no, no, we can, we can eat. We just can't do from that one. In fact, we can't even touch it or else we will surely die. And that's not true either. God doesn't say that. But Satan sees his opportunity to make them question God's goodness, to make them think that he is holding out, that he is keeping something from them. The, the, the temptation of Genesis chapter three challenges the central theme of Genesis one and two, that God is good and wants what is good for us, that he is trustworthy. Adam and Eve had everything that they would ever need in him, and yet they wanted more. And so they reached out and they took the fruit and they ate it. And in that moment, sin entered into the world. The fall, as it's come to be known, happened. And it can really be summed up in in three temptations of pride. First, you have the pride of passion. Eve desired the fruit, almost lusted after it, which led to to the, the, the pride of possession. There was something in her that began to crave what she could not have, and she had to satisfy that desire. She she wanted that thing, whatever it was, in this case, that fruit, and nothing was going to keep her from getting it. And, and really at the core of this temptation is the third pride, the pride of position. You see, it wasn't really the fruit that Eve wanted. She, she could have had any fruit off of any tree in the garden. What she wanted was to be like God. His image was already on her, but Having his attributes was not enough. She wanted his abilities. She wanted his position. She wanted to be in control and call the shots her pride. And and really, to to be honest to the text, it's their pride because it makes very clear that Adam is right there with her. Their pride led to their destruction. Their pride of passion and possession and position created this destruction in their lives and in their world. Their sin led to brokenness in four key relationships that we continue to experience today. At first, it led to broken relationship between us and God. Sin separated Adam and Eve from God. It broke their relationship. In fact, we read it in the text. The very next thing that happens is they hear God walking in the garden. And I love that image of the relationship that they had with the Lord. But they heard him. And what did they do? They They hid. They were ashamed. They were afraid. They hid from God. The relationship with God was never the same. Second, sin broke the relationship between us and others. They didn't just hide from God. They started covering up and hiding from each other as well. They started blaming each other. I mean, we see it in the text. It's almost comical. Adam looks and God says, what have you done? And Adam, like his first response is, this is your fault, God, (laughs) which that never works well, right? (laughs) This woman, God, that you gave me, she deceived me. And, and then Eve starts pointing her fingers and there's this brokenness in the relationship where when we're afraid and we hide and we feel guilt and we feel shame, instead of looking to ourselves and owning up to our own actions, what most of us do is we begin to point the finger and blame and it leads to this broken relationship between us and others. 
Sin broke the relationship between us and ourselves. It's kind of an interesting way to, to, to think about it. But uh, for the first time ever, Adam and Eve felt guilt and shame and fear. They felt condemnation and this internal peace that they had always experienced and always enjoyed was shattered. There was now this brokenness inside of them that they began to experience. And finally, their sin broke the relationship between us and creation. Part of the curse of sin is that we no longer experience harmony between us and the world around us. We work the land with sweat and with toil, and it just seems like creation is constantly fighting against us at every turn. This is the picture that Genesis paints for us of an event that happened a long time ago. But one of the reasons why I believe that the Bible is true is not just because of what it says, but because of how it helps me see and understand my world a little bit more. And so in that way, Genesis 3 also serves as a window through which we can see the world around us, through which we can see and begin to understand why it is the way that it is. So when we look at the the world through the window of this text. It helps us understand why there is something inside of us that says this isn't right when we see evil and pain in the world. It's why we cry out. It is not supposed to be this way when we hear about things like the young lady in our community and student at North who died in the car accident this past week. We hear those things. We say it's not supposed to be this way. We hear of the pain and the brokenness all around us, and there's just something in us that hurts. When we look into the world around us through the window of Genesis 3, it's this constant reminder that something is not right. Something is, is broken. We see it in the way that people act and react. We see it in the way that we treat each other. As coming into the office this past week, one morning, and came up to an, an intersection that, that can get a little bit wonky when you have school traffic and buses, and the bus was trying to turn in left and, and was gonna let a car out so that it could make that, that turn. And, and I could just tell from where I was behind the bus a couple of cars back that, that the lady that was there at the intersection, she was a little bit nervous. She didn't really, this was out of the norm, and so she didn't really know what to do. And, and there's a little bit of a hill that's coming in the other way, and so she's just like, okay, I'm gonna go. And she made a left-hand turn, and about that time, another car came flying up over that hill And instead of just graciously slowing down, he decided that the best idea was just to lay on his horn. And as he passed me, I watched as he threw up double fingers to this lady who was visibly shaken by the entire thing. And man, my heart just hurt for that lady. And if I'm honest, my heart got really angry at the guy. We see the sin of pride all over in the way that we treat one another, the way that we are short and the way that we are demanding and the way that we only look out for ourselves or want what we want when we want it, the way that we use other people. The pride of Genesis 3 is the pride in our world too. We see it in the pride of passion and the pride of possession and the pride of position all around us. I mean, what is it about us that wants so badly what we cannot have, right? We see it in our kids and our grandkids. The best way to get them to want something is what? Tell them they can't have it. And then that's all that they can think about is getting that thing. But man, the same is true for us. People who have affairs, when they go back and they recount and talk about why and what led to it. Oftentimes, they'll say that it's the thrill of something that felt forbidden. It's the same pride of passion and possession and position of the original sin. The pride of Genesis 3 is the pride in our world today, and it leads to the same brokenness a broken relationship with God, broken families and friendships, brokenness within ourselves of the internal struggles of guilt and shame that so many people live with, even brokenness with creation. Listen, brokenness in the creation with the way that we exploit its resources and do not steward the planet that God created and entrusted 
to our care. And that way, Genesis 3 is not just a picture that, that tells us about something that happened long ago. It's a window through which we can look and see and understand the world around us. But if I'm honest, Genesis 3 is also a mirror in my life. I see myself in this passage. I see a reflection of my own desires and pride staring back at me when I read this text. You say, I have this thing in me, and you, you have it too. But I have this thing in me where I want to be God. I want to make my own rules. I want to call the shots. I want to take control of my life, my circumstances, my surroundings. I want to take control of the people that are around me. And I see the pride of passion play out and how easily I am controlled by my emotions and think only of myself, how quickly my anger can flare up. I see the pride of possession and how quickly I justify my actions and my desires, how jealous I am when others get something I feel like I deserve. I see the pride of position in the way that I regularly dethrone Jesus from my heart and say, I'm good, I've got it from here. (laughs) And when I look at my pride in the mirror of Genesis chapter three, I see the same brokenness Adam and Eve experienced. I see brokenness in my relationship with God because of my sin and, and, and against him and against others. I see a wake of brokenness in my relationship because of the pain that I've caused, sometimes because of my defensiveness, sometimes because of my hurtful words or my habits. I see the brokenness that my pride causes in myself, how it brings pain and anger and isolation how I wrestle with feelings of guilt and shame and I hide. I hide afraid of what people would think of me if they really knew me. I see myself in the reflection of Genesis chapter three. But I wonder what you see. What do you see? When, the look, when you look in the mirror of Genesis 3, what do you see staring back at you? Where do you see pride of passion? Pride of possession. Pride of position. Where do you see broken relationships and broken trust because of you, your sin? What is causing you to feel guilt and Shame, is there anything that you are hiding or is there anything that you are hiding from? If you're like me, Genesis 3 is a really hard mirror to look into because I see myself all too clearly. It teaches us about the law of sin that that we are all just kind of bent towards this prideful way of life where we want to take control. We want to get our own way. We can't escape it on our own. And in Romans chapter seven, the apostle Paul writes about this. See See if this sounds familiar, starting in verse 19. He says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I, do not, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, the evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and my inner being, meaning I want to do what is good and right and true and, and noble. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you ever feel that way? That the good that you want to do is not what you do. It's those evil things, those bad things that you don't want to do that you just so naturally gravitate towards. 
It's the law of sin that is at work in every single one of us, waging war inside of us. And it started all the way back at that picture in Genesis chapter three. But the good news for us today is that there is a greater law at work within you too. It's the law of grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that wants to work in you and transform every single thing about you. It's the grace of Jesus that wants to redeem and restore and renew what sin has broken. Grace redeems the picture of the garden in Genesis 3 by putting back the broken pieces of our relationship with God and others, even within ourselves. Grace draws us closer to God, cancels our condemnation, and wipes away all of our guilt and our shame. Grace restores what sin has broken in our world by sending out followers of Jesus to pick up the shattered pieces of people's lives caused by their sin, to be agents of his love and his grace, his peace and his hope. Grace restores how we view our world and those around us. It gives us new eyes to see how God sees. It gives us a new heart to love how God loves. When I pulled onto the road that morning coming into the office, still just feeling a lot of anger about what I just saw, I thought, well, dang it, now I have to pray for that guy. <clears throat> Jesus, why do you have to say things like that? <laughs> And so as I was driving up, I started praying for him. I prayed for him to have a good day. I prayed that God would bless him and his family. And I prayed that he wouldn't be such a jerk, but I prayed for him. <laughs> Grace redeems. Grace restores. And Grace renews. Grace renews the image that we see staring back at us because of Grace because of grace, when God looks at us, when he looks at you, he no longer sees my sin. He no longer sees your sin. He sees his son. He sees the very image of Jesus on you. We are a reflection of Jesus to the world around us as we live lives that look more like Jesus and less like Genesis 3. Grace changes absolutely everything. By grace, the picture is repainted, the world is restored, and we are remade. And it is all because Jesus came into this world to bear the weight of our guilt and our sin and our shame. By his life, death, and resurrection, we can be rescued from the law of sin that wants to destroy and be saved by the law of grace that has come to set us free. So we're gonna close this morning by remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that made all of this happen, that made this grace and ushered it in, made all of this renewal possible, that, that rewrote and repainted the story of Genesis 3 in our lives and for all eternity. And here in a moment, the servers are gonna pass the trays and you can pick up a stack of cups. The bottom one has a piece of bread. The top has a cup of juice. Just help us to remember Jesus' body that was given and his blood that was shed. And as you take in communion this morning, I encourage you just to reflect on those places where you see Genesis 3 in your world and maybe where you see it in your own life. And pray for God to redeem, restore, and renew by grace those things in you. Let's pray. God, thanks for your love and your grace. And thank you, Lord that uh, while sin painted a picture of death and despair, separation, guilt and shame, the gospel, the gospel comes through and paints a better picture, a new picture of grace and love and forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we can have because of that. We remember it now. And Lord, for the person that's in here today that maybe has never taken that step of faith and experienced that grace for the first time through surrendering their life to you, even through baptism, Lord, I pray that you'll give them the courage to take that first step today, to find new life and a fresh start in you. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.